like to call the uh, February meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board to order at this time. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is an adjustment to the agenda. Uh, I need to add on item 14, the consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purposes of discussing negotiations. Uh, I'd like you to add and, and personnel matters to that. All right, is there anyone in the audience that will be wishing to speak tonight on any, um, anything of their choosing that is not already on the agenda? All right, is there any other adjustment to the agenda? The no, Madam Chairman. All right, fine. <coughs> then we'll move on to a consideration of the minutes of January 9th, 1990. Uh, do I, are there any additions or corrections to these minutes? Mr. Greer. On, um, item five, on the early release report, I have received a letter from Rosemary Reed who made a, a presentation that night and she would like it clarified, evidently. Um, uh, I'll read what it says. Discussion followed with many questions asked by board members. Two parents present made statements regarding this early release time. Susan Dana spoke in favor of the half day sessions and Rosemary Reed, representing 14 members of the Middle School Parents of Teachers Association expressed their opposition to the release time. Uh, in her letter, she uh, stated um, Rosemary Reed intended to clearly state the common planning time needed for teaming and the in-service time teachers spend during the early release sessions were not objectionable to Ms. Reed or other members of the Middle School Parents Association. The only objection was that the current scheduling of the early release date created some problems. If that could be corrected to, to right. clarify that. How should we do that? Um, 14 members of expressed their um, uh, opinions <coughs> to the release time or how, how would you like to correct that? They are in favor of, of the um, common planning time. They, they see the need for common planning time but objected to problems created in to students as a result of it. Okay, so express their support for common planning, planning time. time but Objected to problems created for students. Right, correct. All right, do you have that? Okay. Read it as as read as. Um, they did not object to. They did not object to. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start out in a, in a positive way? Express their support <laughs> for common planning time. That's a good way. Express their support for common planning time, but objected to problems created for students. And. Concerning working and non-working parents. Concerning students, yeah, students and parents. Okay. All right, let's hear that now again. Express their support for common planning time, but objected to problems created for students and parents. I think that sounds. There is another correction under the adjustment to the agenda, where it says. Um, Dr. Pelletier explained that he, Loretta Pond, and the school board attorney had met and would have the recommendations for any policy changes. Uh, in, in addition to that should be Gail Parker. That he, Loretta Pond, Gail Parker, and the school board attorney were the ones in attendance at that meeting. All right, are there any other corrections? All right, then do I hear a motion that we accept the minutes as corrected? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor? All right, we will move on to the business manager's report. Mr. LaBelle. This is not a uh, regularly scheduled quarterly report. However, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer. Financially, as far as the revenues, we're pretty much you know, set to date as to how they're coming in. Expenditures are being we have expended 53% of the budget. Um, D, on, yeah. on the superintendent's financial statement through January, it's a page 34, yeah. list by schools. Um, 
on gifted, talented, both the elementary and the middle school. Um, on the elementary, we seem to be ahead of last year. And on the middle school, we seem to be behind last year. Is that because of the readjustment of Possibly that teacher's time or? Possibly an adjustment as to the K-5 concept compared to a K-3 last year. Okay. But it had nothing to do with funding? No. See things? what happens. The, the gifted and talented budgets, per se, as approved by the state, only get accepted like in October or something like that. So the budget process is already done. Okay. But it's just a shift of, just shift of, uh, of expenditures from special ed. Um, I received a letter from the Maine School Board Association or the Maine School Management Association uh, updating us to possible impact of proposed education subsidy adjustments for 1991. Can you tell us how that might impact? Well, what was proposed last week, I guess, and I guess the Dr. Pelletier attended a meeting last Thursday, and I guess the commissioner met with the superintendents and proposed a 4.169% cut in like line 50, which is a total uh, state subsidy to be received by towns and cities. Uh, that would affect us by 71 or $72,000. However, there is some controversy to that because that line, uh, schools that are heavily financed by the state where that, that one line, line 50, is quite sizable, then that means that those uh, communities will receive a larger cut than communities receiving less subsidy. So maybe Daryl can update us on that too. Well, you can imagine that, uh, again, this uh, was a formula arrived at by uh, the commissioner and her uh, department. And it, again, I don't want to use the word violates, but it uh, flies in the face of the formula. And as you all know, the formula is that uh, child's education should not be guided by the wealth of the community. So uh, 161 superintendents, those that had high debt service, were getting hit <coughs> very hard. For example, the man beside me was getting hit to the tune of $400,000. I don't want to give you the name of the town, but it's not as affluent as our town. So uh, the commissioner said she would take this all back, and if any changes were made, would call us all back to another meeting. So we expect to be called back. Whether or not there are going to be any changes, we don't know. But uh, there was a lot of opposition. And if you read the paper, uh, they spotted uh, places like Auburn, Bangor, even Kennebunkport that's losing significant sums. So I expect that we haven't heard the last of this. Is there anything as we as a board could do to, to lobby? Uh, I suspect at this time there probably isn't a great deal. There are 10 weeks left to this legislative session. And uh, I suspect that uh, we're going to hear from the governor and the commissioner again shortly as to what they expect to do. Once they determine what they're going to do, then I could bring it to your attention and then it would be up to the board. Well, I'm certain that the boards that are losing a great deal of money are yelling as well. How have we factored into the budget process so far? How do we what? How, do we, how have we factored in what we know about the state revenue situation, what we're looking at? Face the we we'll take the cut. I yeah. guess that's the, Only that's the standpoint we're doing. We're taking the uh, projected revenues less than 71, 72,000. And Until further opinion, notice. It's just going to get worse, I think, from here. Plus, what you got to also remember is that the, the town of Cape Elizabeth and all communities last year received, uh, we received $77,000 for, uh, to help defer, uh, <laughs> the, no, to help defer the, uh, the uh, low income taxes as far as the credit. And the town got the money, but it was in support of schools. So that along with the 72, that's $150,000. Which we won't see this year. That's correct. Again, I, I believe it's gonna get worse due to what Darrell just said as far as communities or other districts not being happy with the way the proposed cuts are being handed down. 
And also informational to the, the rest of my fellow board members, school bus purchases were also yeah. slated for a slash. I'd like to address that. <laughs> I talked to the state last week regarding our, I wrote them a letter and, and you know, and we are now on a list, we're number two on a list, on a waiting list, I guess. And I don't, I guess we're not gonna bank too much on it. Who knows? If it happens, it won't happen till, till, till June which is no problem really, as long as we spend the money in this year's budget. As far as the federal programs, you know, we're pretty much online as far as the revenue is coming in and expenditures. Where are we on school lunch? Dude? Oh, who knows? I mean, I, <laughs> no, we, we're. I like that positive, positive feeling. We're, we're doing a lot of different things. We've, we've, <coughs> we've cut back or, Realign the hours at the high school starting right after vacation. We have uh, increased some of the prices, not major changes. We are, we do have other recommendations that I'd like to, to uh, Sue and I have talked about and probably recommend to you people at the March meeting. It could be a, a proposed increase at the, uh, at the Pond Cove and Middle School as far as price changes. As far as uh, from a dollar fifteen to a dollar twenty-five, this would mean like we figured out like nine hundred dollars a month in in revenue. Uh, our food costs is, is what's killing us. Our labor costs, I think we've identified and we've we're trying to, to control them. However, surprisingly, it's costing us like two dollars or two dollars and five cents to to produce a meal, and we're charging a buck fifteen on the on the hot lunch. D, I, I still yeah. don't understand. For example, why October was for food 10,500 and something, and January was 25,000. Very deceiving, I th and I've I've got to I've got to change my way of reporting to you people. I guess I think we need to add a few lines and, and consider inventories. Basically, all this is, Jan, is that some bills are in October were not paid in October and just in November and you know down the line. What I want to do is, I guess we're going to have to go to an accrual type system where we take, it, take into consideration your, your beginning inventories plus your purchases plus your inventories to come out to a you know, better cost figure. At the end of the year, this all comes together on the cash basis, but it's deceiving throughout the year. Like some months are high, some months are low in that. Uh, we, we'll work on that. I always find a way to uh, mention this at almost every board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. You've given me the opening down there. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't pass up an opportunity. Rather than just adding the inventory, the ideal would be to have a true budget program where you budgeted your expenditures and your receipts throughout the year, and then as you had actual experience in sales, you would stack that up against the budget and you would see the variance. And you would do the same thing on the, uh, on the expenses. What are you doing next summer, Peter? <laughs> I don't write software, I just use it. <laughs> I know it exists, but I don't know how to get it onto your computer. But, no, I, I hear that. Uh, we, we, I will find another way to report, especially the school lunch, because, you know, there's too many unpaid bills or purchases out there that are not reported as, as on, a, on a cool basis. D, uh, why were, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, why were salaries so much lower in January? Was uh, that as a result of any cost-effective? We had, uh, uh, we had uh, one week of uh, exams at the high school where basically the school was open, school lunch was open Monday and not the rest of the week, okay. except for a couple hours in the morning. Okay. Yeah, but would that cut it in half? Well, it's, it's, it runs well, about $13,000 a month. December was a little more. The average. Uh, the December, you, ha you had uh, five full weeks of, of payroll yeah, compared right. to the other ones of four problem. There are a lot of factors to this. It's like, I think we need to, to probably break it down to a, a per diem type thing where we can identify our costs in a per diem and our revenues in a per diem. And, you know, if we operate 19 days out of the month, it'll give us an idea. 18 days, shouldn't, the variance should be, shouldn't be that great. It should be stay the same as far as the per diem cost. Well, right now it says we've lost $26,000 to date. Is that my reading that right? You're reading it right. 25 for the year to date, is that what it is? We've lost 25 year to date, and we had a, a uh, 1,240. That should be, that 1,240 on the far right should not be in, in parentheses. That should be a, a, a positive 
figure. Okay, so, we're, so we've we're, lost 25, 472, 17. Now, do you see that coming back to even itself out between now and the end of the year, or are we going to look at a, a loss of $25,000 for the year? I don't, I wouldn't try to guess the loss, John, but it, there is going to be a loss out there. And through the budget process, in the next two, three weeks, we would like to, to present you people a budget and recommended ways or suggestions, I guess, to, to fund school lunch over and above what we feel we can charge the kids. This format is different than the way you presented this before. <coughs> You've always broken it down by schools. Uh -huh. yeah. Haven't we ever For had reports lunch? by high, by revenues and expense expenses by high school, middle school, so. elementary? We have. But for school lunch? Yeah. No. This has been the same for two, two and a half years. I think that's years. the other. The core. The, uh, well, the, the general program is broken down by school. Yes. Okay. But I don't think lunch ever, the financial statement is. Uh, commodities this year, we're, we're receiving nil. And that's hurting us. You know, the seven or eight or ten thousand dollars that we used to get from the state through the, through the, uh, the feds is not coming in. I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm just concerned that we've got 20, we're showing a $25,000 loss right now, and we're going to have to look at how we budget this next year. First mm -hmm. of all, can we absor where can we absorb the loss this year if it continues at that level? If, if that's the optimistic high point, maybe it'll get less, or the most pessimistic, excuse me. And how do we, you know, I think we need a recommendation from you for next year, <coughs> excuse yeah, me, on, on how we can not spend 15 minutes every meeting talking about the fact that we're losing money in school lunch. Well, here, let me. All right, I don't need an answer now, but. All right. I, don't I want to talk some more about that That's at fine. some point. Uh, maybe even a, a workshop or something. You know, the board and myself and the director or something. We need to do something, I agree. Hopefully, this is on the high side. The 25 as maximized, and hopefully, we'll start declining. Uh, other districts are. Everybody's school lunch program is in, is in has got problems. Next year, with the cuts over and above what the, the local or the general budget could lose, the state is also recommending or at this point uh, proposing that they cut 17 cents out of the full paid lunches in subsidy. And that would hurt again. So it's coming at us, you know, different different angles, and not, not only the general program, but school lunch and other things. And if I remember correctly, we're one of the only schools that don't subsidize at this point the school lunch program, right? Correct. One of the very few, very few. So it's operated on a... Uh, some schools are running 50, 60, 70, 80,000 a year in the red. And they've been carrying it over and over, hopefully hoping that it'd come back. And it's just not doing that. Food costs, I think, are a major part of it. Plus, you know, the... Uh, Everything. I mean, the equipment. Our equipment is pretty depleted too. We've we've made application on a grant for uh, seven thousand dollars, and the state would would fund uh, thirty five of that, thirty five hundred. I don't know if we're going to get it. I hope we do because we do need the equipment. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Did I understand that you have raised some prices on at, at the high school? At the <laughs> car. Only at the high school. That's correct. And and they were notified of it. Yeah. Uh, well, I think there were some good complaints good question, that I, I heard think, that yeah. uh, it came as a surprise to a number of people. I just heard that today, and I guess the intention was not to, to surprise people. Now, uh, the price increases were, to my knowledge, quite minor, a nickel and a dime here and there. Uh, possibly, or we should in, in the future, I guess, alert people of changes. Thank you. Would. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. And then the, the last report, which is always the, the best to look at, is community services. Could, could I ask Sue a question could, about that? Sure. Sue, I, I, I noticed under revenues that, that we have a $3,500 budget for teens, and that $300 of that has been spent this year. And I wondered oh. if there are any plans for programs for, for high school age students in lieu of the fact that they're not having dances and that type of thing, if there was any plans out there for ways that perhaps the young people can come together through the community service. Well, I'm looking at, I was looking at revenue, but also under expenditures there were, was $5,800 budgeted and only 850 of that has been spent. So it's a very small percentage of the money that, that had been budgeted.
okay, what comes in usually goes out. And the SAT course money has not been deposited at this time, nor has it been expended. Okay. So that will bring both accounts up. There is some money in there for um, some ski trips. Um, I, there's also some they're money They're planned that, and, and ready to go. And they're ready to go as well. Okay. And those revenues are not deposited, nor have we expended the money there either. Okay. So that was essentially what that uh, $3,500 that had been budgeted would be for SATs. Yes. Money and uh, ski trips. Right. All right. Thank you. Then following is on page 38 is the enrollment report. We, as of February 1st, we had 1,571 students in Cape Elizabeth schools. Do you, Jan? In, um, in kindergarten, first grade, third, fourth, the enrollment has gone up from, from last month. In, in any of these places, are we over the, the board's maximum numbers for classes? Barbara, can you address that, please? Third grade, which you uh, would encourage us to keep at 22, we do have 23 in a few of those classrooms at this point, Jim. Um, fourth grade, we've talked about before, there is a high of 24 in a couple of those classrooms as well. Um, we just placed, we just had um, enter today three more children, grades K1 and 2, for the Monday following vacation. Uh, we aren't in trouble with numbers. Uh, yet we are pushing some first grades into 19 and we have had hoped to keep those around 18 so yeah they're creeping up a little but not uh, alarming to us I'm, I'm not pleased with fourth grade numbers but we didn't have a lot of option and we've talked about that before so okay. finished thank you thank you any other questions from the board all right we'll move on to the comments by the high school representatives Peter and Jennifer Um, well, there's just a couple things tonight. First of all, this speech team won the state their sixth consecutive state championship on February 3rd, so we're all pleased about that. Um, it was, first of all, a, an, a win that was expected, but second of all, it was a fun weekend because on Friday night, the entire team spent a night at the, at, um, the Country Inn Motel in Bangor. Instead of making the trip up at 4 o'clock in the morning, we, uh, the team went up Friday night to and um, spent the night there, so it was a fun weekend and satisfying also in that they did win. Um, the other thing is that the trip to France is leaving tomorrow, and um, they'll be visiting the Loire Valley, um, some chateaus down there, and then they'll be going up to Paris for the remainder of their three-week trip. So I know they're all looking forward to that, and, um, and that's about it. How many are going on that trip, Peter? I'm sorry? How many are going on that trip? Um, I think the number is eight this year, eight or ten. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, winter sports are winding down. All the basketball teams had their last regularly scheduled games last Friday. They were very successful um, that night as well as throughout the season. The state basketball games will begin Saturday, I believe, in Augusta. So we're looking forward to some good outcomes. Um, ice hockey has won their last two games. And they have one more game left in the season, so we're, we're rooting for them too. And the swim team is very successful in their southwestern meet. And their state meet will be coming up very soon. All the teams had really good seasons this winter, as we predicted, and the support from the team, the support from the town is much appreciated by all the teams. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, the first item of business is a report on the team building workshop. Dr. Pelletier. Madam Chairman, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to ask the television people, this is extremely important that uh, the board as well as the community uh, see, can see and understand this evening what we hope to recommend for space facilities. And can I ask the camera people whether or not they can see the graphics? Yep, I can see it. I like that. All right. First, I'd like to uh, explain to uh, 
the board, uh, how we went about this. This required uh, more than 20 hours of work on the part of the entire administrative council. And uh, it's quite complicated, and I'm going to try to present it as best I can. Uh, first of all, philosophically, we looked at three criteria when we looked at what we should do in terms of space needs. And the first one was we wanted to retain the integrity of our programs, what we've been talking about here for th four years. Secondly, we wanted to retain the integrity of the organization. Uh, as you know, we're avid uh, believers in a K-5, a middle school philosophy, and a high school philosophy. And lastly, but not least, we took a hard look at the cost benefits of the whole thing. Now, what I'd like to do tonight is present the demography, show you what we took a hard look at, uh, give you some of the pros and cons of each of them, and then give you our recommendation. And then, Madam Chairman, if they can establish the ground rules, I'd like to open it up at that point in time. Because if I'm able to go through all of the process, I'm sure I'll answer an awful lot of questions along the way. First of all, I'm going to give you a few facts. Number one, we have three demography studies. One we have done ourselves, one that was done by the person that's doing the state demography, and one done by the New England School Development Council. Those range <coughs> from 1,614 as a total population in 1996-97 to 1790. Now while you see a discrepancy here, the three demographies were done in, with different kinds of formulas. Just so you get a clear picture of the one we're looking at, in the year 2000, after getting a high of 1614, we expect to be below the population this month. Now, if that demography holds, this is what we're recommending. Number one, in 1990, we need four classrooms. And in 1991-92, we need an additional classroom. And in 92-95, we need one. The red dots represent one we've recovered. So the red dots are a minus one, and the black ones are a plus one. So with that, you have, in the year 1991, four classrooms. 91-92, one classroom. 92-93, one classroom, because you know we have two that we recovered. And in 93-94, three classrooms. For example, one would be in the fourth, one would be in the seventh, one would be in the eighth. And you will note graphically that the bulge is going through the school system. And if you look, here at 96, 97, you're going to start to see the bulge in the high school. Now, if that's the case, we need nine rooms over this period of time. So we looked at the following things. The first we looked at was to move the eighth grade to the high school. And here are some of the pluses of that and some of the minuses. We'd have to restructure the high school. It's cost effective. The children would have better science facilities and labs. We could integrate the home economics program with industrial technology. And we could address the political issue that there are parts of the high school that are unused. Now some of, the, some of the points that we did not like were it lops off a third of the middle school. 
We also felt that parental reaction to sending eighth graders to the high school would not be too positive. We also said there's lack of time to restructure a whole new program at the high school by putting in a group of eighth graders. Current research does not support sending eighth graders to a high school. There'd be fragmentation of the co-curricular program. <coughs> the administrator's responsibilities would be such that would we have dual responsibilities or dual administrators. And more importantly, it's very in inconsistent with the message that we've been talking about for four years. Now, the next thing we looked at was to send the kindergarten to the high school. Now, one of the problems with the kindergarten to the high school is, number one, it would give us four rooms, but number two, it would split the classes. Fourth graders would be in two buildings and some would be running back and forth with the special areas, <coughs> like phys ed, music, art, computers, and what have you. So the special act activities would be, it would fill the high school space, but it would affect our daycare center that's growing rapidly at the high school. And with, at least at this point in time, we do not have another space for that. And more importantly, it would destroy the integrity of a K-5 organization. Uh, as a matter of fact, in our deliberations, that was the one plan that we didn't like at all. Now, then we looked at the third plan. And the third plan, as you can see, was to move middle school, industrial arts, and home economics <coughs> to the high school. Now the pros for that were there'd be excellent facilities. We might be able to save a teacher. We would make better use of the high school space. <coughs> There'd be curriculum improvement along these lines. It would be cost effective and save money, time, and it would take care of short range problems. Now the points that we didn't like where the curriculum would not be as good, it's different. It would disrupt <coughs> the middle school program. There'd be loss of communication and integration among the faculty. And the impact on high school scheduling and logistics was almost impossible because we'd have to schedule those schools in a similar fashion and it would make it extremely difficult. And of course there'd be time that would be difficult. The next area we looked at was to ask for portables. Now, I'd like to make a few points. I think the day is going to come, if we do not build a school, where we're going to have to ask for portables. But it would seem to me that to ask for nine portables as a solution would, to, would be to build a, uh, the word is, uh, I've got to remember the right word that they're using in some of the communities in this state. It's called School Shack City. Now where would you put nine portables if that's the way you go? Now, one of the things about the portable structures, the program integrity could be salvaged, we could shift them with the bulge if we had a place to put them. It would appear to be the least physically disruptive kind of thing. The staff would probably support it. The cost would be approximately a quarter of a million dollars for a five year period of time. And that's minimal. We're talking about $1,500 per month. Are we talking about the same kind of portables we've, we've put at Pond Cove and at the middle school now, are we talking about different kind of portables? We are talking about a different kind of portable. We're talking about the kinds of portables that you see in a large number of schools that appear to be like trailers. 
Uh, the specs are far different. Uh, they're generally outdoors. You go outdoors to get into them, unless you can hook them all together the way they did in Brunswick. We have, we, over the last two years, we've saved a tremendous amount of money by constructing what we had called portables up to this point. Uh, if I remember correctly, the town paid for them and the town was reimbursed by the state, so there was actually no cost for us to the town for these additional spaces. Why, is that program no longer available in the state of Maine? If we were to say we wanted to conduct, excuse me, construct eight new classrooms? No, that program is still viable, still here. However, uh, we've discussed this with the town. It would mean an outlay uh, that would affect their budget considerably. And uh, I can pass this on because I've talked to the town manager. This would not be the year, from his point of view, to request funds for portables for a variety of reasons that I would rather have him repeat. If we borrowed the money, would that then only be the, uh, the interest would only be our expense? Do we not have money from the bond issue that was passed last year that we have not yet spent that we could use? We, we didn't earmark any of that money for a bond issue, I mean for portables. The, all the portable money we've ever discussed was to be up front by the town and then we would pay them rent. And that program is still viable uh, providing they have the money to uh, you know, set them up for us and purchase them or rent them. But, but we could borrow that money from a bank yes. and pay the interest, and the interest would be our expense, but that we would be given the money back by the state other than the interest. Right. Uh, you can, uh, the school cannot buy a portable and be reimbursed properly. It's got to be bought by the, by the town. We lease it from the town. The town leases it to Cable's School Department where we pay them, um, the town pays us $8 a square foot, I mean the state, and we just take, take the $8 and get a check and give it to the town. So if, if the, let's say the, the portables that we put up in the past year cost $100,000, the town didn't get reimbursed for that $100,000? It will over a period of time. Over a period of time. So what happens, the town put up 150000 last year, 193000 the year before. They put up a quarter of a million dollars over the past two years. They've depleted some of their funds in order for us to get those, which is fine, but you know they need to build up again. And the plan that Dr. Pelletier is going to uh, summarize is at some point we still will need some portables, but not for a few years, hopefully. I portables, mean, portables, in my view, should be the kinds of classes that get you over small hurdles, uh, and not like I won't name the town that has 32 of them or 15, or 17. There are 137 in Cumberland County. Now, the day will come when we will be able to get portables from some of those schools if the construction money comes through for very small amounts of money. And we could loan, borrow for a year or two, and then send back. That's the, the purpose of a portable. Uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to come back to the portables in this plan because I think it's the lifesaver for the community. Now, if I may. I'm sorry. We looked at restructuring the middle school space. And as you know, the middle school concept now is quite different than the way high schools are scheduled. One thing about this plan is there's less disruption. Apparently, there appears to be a lot of staff support for this. It promotes a certain amount of integration. It will probably dilute to a small degree, and that will depend on who you're talking to, the industrial arts program. So we are recommending the following for <coughs> next year and the years ahead. as the more viable solution to our problem. Number one, that the chorus class, which is in the homemaking industrial arts section of the middle school, 
that we use the stage in the gymnasium for chorus. And we have talked with the builders as to how we can design that. The principal has been to a school where that has been done, and we can build a very adequate classroom chorus station there and obtain the chorus room in the middle of school as a classroom. Now we can restructure the industrial arts and band area, which is opposite to the choral section of the present time. And it would look something like this. The IA room would be smaller and be exactly where it is, and we would create one, two, three rooms, and the band room would be where it is, except that it would be smaller. Now, we have looked into soundproofing with the band and the IA room and the stage, and that's quite possible. We're told that we can do that. Lastly, on the top floor of the old high school, we would make two additional rooms, four, six, and seven. One would be far larger than the other, but with some kind of rearranging, the staff could work, at, work that out. Now, if you accept this recommendation and you go back to the basics, you can readily see that we could go into the 93-94s. And in this area, we would have at least three good ears and possibly four to see what we need to do about building. Now here, in this year, 93-94, you could put two portables and get rid of one the following year. Now, this is predicated on all of the K-3 population from here back that we have no idea what can happen to it. It's going to be able to get into the space that we provided. If you look at the uh, demography, it appears to me that we will not pick up any rooms on a K-3 level prior to this ball's going through. If something happens, and it does, then we may be in more difficulty, and you may have to use portables at an earlier age. But one of the things that this does allow, it allows, to, it allows us to have at least three and possibly four good years to see what's going to happen here. The cost of this refurbishing is a little less than $50,000. So it's far more cost effective. And it gives us an opportunity to see what's going to happen. Have you looked at what this increase in population does to the rest of the services that are available in the school? You have a cafeteria that is already uh, overtaxed, overutilized. Uh, you've got a gymnasium that is, has been built to handle a certain number of classes and now it's going to be required to handle more classes. Uh, there are other impacts other than just the kids don't spend eight hours a day in a room. They have to interact and they have to walk around the hallways and they have to use other resources. <coughs> Has that been looked at? Yes. For example, we presently now have two art rooms in that complex. We have to look at that as a complex because we're going to be sharing uh, teachers uh, between four and five in the middle school. We have to share the cafeteria. Now that is going to be difficult, but one thing about that is you can assign different lunch periods so that, you know, I'd hate to see them go from lunch from 10 to 2, but I don't think it would get to be that bad. Now the gymnasium is always a problem, but at the same time, two seasons of our year, those youngsters can go out. Uh, computers, we were talking about that this evening. We probably will have to reduce the amount of time that kids get computers, because you can't get more youngsters and the same number of computers and the same number of staff members and get the same amount. So 
What will happen during these years as we grow and we really press those ancillary facilities, we're going to have to cut down on the amount of time they get these kinds of activities until such time as 95. Now, our enrollments start to go down again, and in the year 2000, if we're at 1,500, those facilities are going to be exactly where they are today. And we think we have a pretty good program today. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that it was the administrative council that, that did the work, and you also mentioned staff support. Were the teachers asked for their ideas or polled? Is, is that how you know whether or not the staff supports the idea? No, I think that was conveyed by our principal, uh, particularly at the middle school, which is getting the blunt of this. And uh, Chris, are you here? Yes, yes I'm sorry. Uh, the attitude of the teachers, I've spoken with a number of the teachers, and I'm sure that Chris has, but this was conveyed to us through the principal. Would you like to substantiate that? The way I would characterize the, um, I guess the way this decision uh, was received is that given the options that were presented, um, this one was one that seemed to make the most sense. Um, given pulse or not uh, resolution because of uh, the funding situation, it was felt that the um, the major goal should be program integrity. And I guess the, the staff understands that. Uh, to say that they're pleased by having to reduce or to change the programming, I think, a little bit. But I understand that this is a vocal uh, program. I did have an opportunity to talk at great length um, with, with the teacher. Randy Perkins, and um, we think that we have uh, things of hand for transferring the old arts program to a technology-based industrial arts program. Um, there is uh, some heavy equipment which exists in the <coughs> industrial arts tech lab, which um, hasn't been used. Uh, we have a, f a foundry, for example, which I believe um, was probably there when it was a high school lab. Uh, we don't do any foundry work and could possibly get savings there. There's a great deal of very good heavy machinery, planers, drill presses, and it would be, as I said, it would be a shame to lose those. However, um, with, a, with a change in the curriculum, um, we could adjust for that. What you have to realize is the lab that we have there was, was originally designed as a high school lab. So as a middle school lab, it is probably, arguably, one of the best in the state. But given the compromises that we have to make in order to accommodate the populations that we're getting, um, some compromises um, are being looked at in that area. One of the negatives was it dilutes the industrial arts program. Specifically, what will be offered now? Well, I think we, as I said, technology, uh, which is not as large a part um, of the program at this point. Uh, technology meaning um, Mr. Perkins is looking, for example, at offering a unit on robotics which is using computers and robots, mechanical devices, um, as a way of showing students what's, what's available in technology. There's a possibility we could make uh, some use of the uh, very extensive computer facilities that we have at the middle school. Another thing that we're looking at is that it is possible, there's some precedent for this, it's very early in the stages of thinking, but, for example, in, um, in our phys ed program, 
we do make use of the high school pool for a unit on swimming and that seems to work quite well so it's possible that we might be able to use the facilities at the high school if we can schedule it for some of the more heavy machinery types of things that could exist at the high school. Again, we need, this is very early in the thinking because we haven't actually touched base with the high school teachers and certainly with, with the principal of the high school to see if that's a real possibility. Chris, um, in, yes. uh, in uh, what way does each individual teacher get to express opinion? Do you have a big meeting? Do you circulate a questionnaire? I would say that their opinions were not solicited prior to making the recommendation but I guess I would see that the recommendation being made is an opportunity for the administrative team to say here's what we went through, here's what we think, here's a recommendation we're looking at and I would say that tonight you may get some feedback about that. I did receive feedback um, and I was very, I think I was very clear in explaining to my staff that this was a compromise that I felt um, was something that that could be supported in terms of a compromise. As I said, I I would hesitate to say that this is something that they would choose to do in the best of all possible worlds. Well, we know we're not in the best of all possible right. worlds, but how do they think it stacks up uh, to some of the other alternatives okay. that uh, have been described? If If I had to speak for them, I, I think they would have chosen portables. Um, however, in our deliberations, um, and it, it, was, it was a long deliberation, the Administrative Council determined that the portables were perhaps not a viable solution at this point in time. But the, the for teachers... For financial reasons or for other reasons? Primarily financial and political political that was my understanding and at, that is that at this point perhaps the community seeing that there were uh, the the perception of extra space in the system primarily at the high school which is not necessarily true either that perhaps um, there would not be community support for money for more space as long as there were, quote, underutilized space in another part of the system, the school system. So that was taken into consideration. Let me, let me uh, address that. Peter, uh, and I'm going to put it right on the line. It's my feeling as a superintendent that uh, when we went before the zoning and the planning board, we didn't receive a great deal of enthusiasm for portable classrooms. Now that was part of the political strategy that we were thinking about. And if I missed that, I'd be more than happy to hear from the chairman of both boards. The planning and zoning board, I assume. Right. Well, I, what I, when I asked the question about political, uh, I had a feeling that you meant the, uh, the finances uh, principally, although you're now introducing another element, which I believe is the aesthetics. Uh, it's, it's my feeling that uh, they I would I would say probably is the aesthetics or the temporary nature of that kind of building and uh, why aren't we thinking of uh, uh, something more long term and I think you know why we're not is because we do want do not want to get caught with uh, 151,000 square feet uh, where the population has been cut in half so we're in a dilemma and uh, we've attempted uh, to uh, come up with the best possible solution that we could. Also, in our deliberations, because uh, we've all been at this a long time, uh, we also feel there's a certain amount of money. And if we're going to put money in portables, we probably won't get it for programs. And programs are the most important thing in our mind. And any way we can find to retain our programs uh, over guns and butter, as they say, we'd like to do that. But I, I'm sorry, but I thought the portables were reimbursed by the state. 
I mean, if we, if, what if we ask the town to borrow money for portables with us paying the interest on that money? And I, I don't know, whatever, 12% or whatever the interest is, I don't, I, you know what we got on our bond. Um, and maybe put music and band on those portables or something like that and, and got the kind of portables that we have now. Uh, have you seen a, a portable, what they classify a portable? It's like 625 square feet per class. I, I, don't think, I don't think anybody in this community welcomes the thought of having their kids out in trailers. I mean, that's, that's what I've seen at some other schools. What we have, we've probably been spoiled by calling what we have done in the last two years as an effort to increase the space that we have as portables. I mean, they've got sonotube foundations. They're... they're relatively stable, they're not going to rock in the wind, uh, you know, you don't have to go outdoors to go into them, they're contiguously designed. I mean, give credit where credit's due, you did a great job in putting those up. I guess what we're saying now is why can't we continue knowing full well that the state will support that and reimburse us for that, why do we have to, why is the only alternative that we have tonight to be um, let's cut up what we have internally Let's reduce the programs that we can offer and, and cut back on some of the programs that we're offering um, and not put up the kind of portables that we've seen before. The thought of a band room being in the middle of three classrooms, talk about aesthetics. I think that, that, that has some real problems. Uh, and I would like, hopefully, the person that, that gave you uh, an assurance that, that they could muffle the sound would put that in writing and guarantee that. Uh, and if there was a problem, we'd come back and then re-insulate. I'm not sure that anybody could do that for us or would be willing to do that. But the idea of a full band playing right beside the door of three classrooms, I think is, it really reeks of a lot of problems. I don't know. My son plays the saxophone. And, uh, you, and you have a big house. I live in a fairly large house. <laughs> Your neighbors have said that. <laughs> That's right. Well, if we were to follow the alternative that uh, is being discussed and not suggested, <coughs> that uh, we were in year one to design and develop uh, two portables that would be doubles to uh, house the youngsters here, uh, that would be just twice what we did last year, except for inflation, uh, which means do we have a single right now? Is that what we have? Is what's called a single? No, no. We or do we have a, a double? It's a four unit. What we got. It's a full unit. Four unit. Four unit. You could have four classrooms in those portables. Um, well, we put the library and the, and the computer center now in the middle school. But you would, those would not necessarily have to be classrooms. If you moved, for yeah, instance, you move your band and put it down in that corner, and yeah. then how many classrooms would that give you in, in well, if you that have area? Four unit. You need two of those for the band, and then you're going to have. Band would give you You're two. going to have to have two classes right beside the band, whether they like it or not. Unless well, what, you put what, what, band and uh, chorus music. Well, you can't put phys ed. So right. All you can put is you're already doing the computer, so you can put. Why can't you put, put four? The chorus. Why can't you put four classrooms in there? Well, you're right beside the band. If that's the case, and that's one of the reasons why you know. Be bad words. Yep, if you left band where you it band was, you'd have four classes. band where it is, put four classes into a four portable, which means the following year you had one, one, and three, at which time you'd have nine portables. And then it would start to be reduced if the population is as we see it. And then you could get rid of it. I remember at the middle school um, workshop we had, there, there was a, a, a need to, to make that library more centrally located anyway. And if we could connect around to that middle school wing so they wouldn't have to come up and go past the office and down the long hall to get to the library, that would make a, a path for them through, through another portable to get to the library. Would, would, I mean, that would really enhance the program, wouldn't it? Well, we, the, we, we have can. a constraint there with the fire, but uh, that can always be worked out. Do, I do think we that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to ask if we determined um, that 
there is no space anywhere at Pond Cove for portables. We've looked at that on two occasions. Uh, it's my personal feeling that they wouldn't allow us to put them in the front of the building. That's on Scott Dyer Road. You know, that, I don't know that we'd meet any of the regulations there. You certainly can't put them in front of the school. In the back of the school, you're between two playgrounds. I'm not sure that we, whether or not we would be allowed to put them off the kindergarten wing. Again, that would mean pulling back fourth graders and dividing them. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And that, again, was one of the ingredients that we didn't like. In two buildings, that is. But, but right now, with this proposal, if you're going to move fifth grade classrooms down next to where the band is, you're basically, basically moving them into the middle school away from the four or five grouping that you wanted to have. So you're going to leave fourth graders out in Never Never Land anyway. They're, gonna be, they're not going to be in Pond Cove. They're going to be all by themselves in one spot in the old high school. Is that right? Am I right? Quite. We're going to have fourth and fifth graders, so we had planned there because uh, of the accessibility and handicap. Uh, I think that was our plan to use uh, a child who's a paraplegic to be on that floor level for at least two years. So that would be a fourth and a fifth grade sometimes. But half the fifth grades would, at least half. And the fifth them. graders would, half of them would be somewhere else. It'd have to be. That's one of the difficulties with the plant. Uh, we're, we have two organizations in, in one container uh, depend on where we can get space with growing enrollments. And you're right. I think uh, some grade or some grade level or more than one is going to be divorced from their friends or their unit uh, for the next five years. Could I speak on that for a moment, please? I guess I can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the chairman. I would like somebody to address why kindergarten at the high school is a completely inappropriate possibility so that it was omitted from the four. And the reason I want him to, to address this is, and it's, it must be my ignorance, but it, as you say, some people are going to be divorced from the school anyway. These are people who go, these are young people who go to school since a day. Uh, many of them are probably already more comfortable in the high school because they've gone to preschool there or, or go, and they will be going to after school programs in the high school. Uh, I, I don't even know if this occurs, but I would not think that a kindergartner would need specials. Seems like that I don't even know if they have them. But it's when they're in school less than three hours a day, perhaps they wouldn't need music. They wouldn't need a special art teacher. They wouldn't need a special PE teacher. Um, and it somehow, I, I feel like we're still skirting the issue of the fact that the high school is not full. And the high school has space. And we're doing everything we can to try to make that not be the issue. And, and there are people that say, until the high school is being utilized, then we don't support funding other places. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, and, and like I say, I, I don't know the answers to those. But it just seems like those children don't care where they are. All those teachers would remain together. Um, and and the fourth graders going back to the elementary school is not as far across that mall as it is to walk from the old area where they are now down to where the classrooms would be that you're speaking of, the new classrooms. Uh, let me just clarify one point. While I left it off my report, it was, as a matter of fact, it was the alternative that we collectively threw out. Oh. And, uh, and somehow I, it, it seems like in church, it, in relation it should be done. Uh, but the consequences are such that they, there's that division. And number two. Excuse me, there's what division? 
well, you know, for the for half of the fourth grade would come back and be in a different unit. But they're going to be split anyway. Yeah. Well, You're already saying that at least one fourth grade is going to have to be down yeah. for, for handicapped reasons. And you won't have all your fifth grade together. There'll be some still in the, uh, the old high school area. And so nobody's going to be completely together. I would say, uh, I'll go back to my first criteria. We didn't want to cut any of the units apart from our organization and our programming. Now, it's my understanding that those young people do get art, music, phys ed. They do get that. And then I suspect some of them probably start to get special services. So, you know, th there's a full program there for them. If you send them to the high school, I'm not so certain that we'd send art people and music people and special services over. Uh, or if we did, you know, they would have to commute. That means there's less time. Uh, it just, we discussed it at length, and it didn't seem to be a very viable alternative to us. Well, I can appreciate that. Now, at the same time, our community services is using some of the space there. That means we'd have to move them. Uh, but that's, you know, that certainly can be done. But would those, those, there wouldn't be an overlap, would there? Don't you come in after school? Okay. Okay. See, and that's a growing program. Uh, all of these are, are viable, but they're all consequences, advantages, and disadvantages. I wonder when you talk about, you know, which is the lesser of two evils, keeping one through five basically together, or trying to keep K through three and then taking four and five and. Uh, Somehow, I, I think that's a question that might be asked, too, perhaps. Excuse me, would you repeat yeah. that question? <laughs> okay. If we're going to be splitting up four and five and, and having half here and half there and, and so forth, I just wonder, you know, which is, is worse, to, to try and keep one, grades one through five as much together as possible and have kindergarten someplace else or try and keep kindergarten where it is and move four and five all around. Yeah. Well, now, let me, let me just, organizationally, you know, this year we've been very fortunate. It seems to be working very well. Our K-5 program has administrators on four, five, and K-3, and that's worked very nicely. And those organizations are, are there. And I think that means a lot because they're working very closely with the staff on curriculum. Uh, now, to move half of it, it's difficult to have an administrator in one building responsible for what's happening to the teachers in another building. Now, that doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but it would be far more difficult to do some of the kinds of things we're doing. Are, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I find this is a bit like playing three-dimensional chess, which is difficult in itself. I've never played it anyway, but we don't have a board or the boards. Uh, it, it's hard to visualize all these things. I would suggest we take a slightly different tack, and that is make this part of the budget process and come to us with two possibilities. One, which would be, for lack of a, another description, for lack of a better description, the portable alternative, and that would have a cost. That might be more attractive from a program point of view. It may not, but let's say that, let's say that it is. And secondly, the cutting up the, the middle school, which is essentially the $50,000 proposal, and cost those two proposals out right to the penny. Evaluate the effects on the program, the students, the teachers, et cetera and uh, look at it in terms of the budget. And when we have a better idea of how much money we have to spend and how much money we have to spend, uh, how much we can add or how much we have to subtract, we can make a judgment as to the effect on the, the taxpayers and the town and discuss that among ourselves and with the, uh, the town council. Certainly, we could be more than happy to do that. That would be very easily done. I would only ask one uh, question and Dee can help us. Uh, we might even have to start proceedings. 
Uh, D, how much time would it take for us to go through the planning and the zoning board? That's very important because we, if we chose one alternative, we'd have to start, you know, building in summer. March, April, we'd have the time. We'd have the time. Peter, yeah. I, the only problem that, that I see with that, and, and you probably have the solution, is the parental in, input and the community's knowledge of what's going on and what the plan is and how it's progressing. I don't know how we would keep them informed. Of well, I guess I mentioned everybody but the parents. Uh, but The budget process is an open I, I did, uh, did mean the community. When I, didn't I mention parents, students, teachers, administrators? No. Anyway, <laughs> you parents. Meant. I meant parents. Uh, but I think the point is the, uh, that is the answer. It is uh, part of Come the, to the, the budget process. Me. When we make that hard decision, if that's indeed the way everybody agrees to try to make this decision, there would, I'm sure, with the publicity and with the interest uh, that this subject has, uh, uh, just look at the number of people who are here this evening and the amount of correspondence and phone calls we've gotten, it's a subject which is going to attract a lot of attention. I think we'll get a lot of input. Is a workshop unfeasible before the budget if they have both proposals? I, I think, it's, I think it's not feasible only because we've been trying to set up a curriculum workshop yeah. before the budget process and, and it cannot, it can't be done. There are people, I mean, it could be done with some people missing. But this has but more of a budgetary not, impact. Right. Well, the, it, that also some, does. Yeah, well. adults. Are we really, is this, is this being approached in the right, we're looking at this from an economic standpoint. Is that the right way to look at this? We're not looking at this from the perspective of what's best for the kids. We're looking at it from a dollars and cents standpoint, and I come to—I happen to watch um, the, the town the uh, on the cable the other night. I happen to watch the school board in South Portland, and they're facing the same problem. And and I guess the biggest problem was again, they're facing it from an economic issue. Well, let's face it: there's not one of these plans is what's best for kids. Not one. I mean, there's not one that I'm proud of. Uh, but uh, it, it really turns out to be the lesser of evils because none of them are, are without a lot of real problems. Yeah, that's very well said, and I think you can't emphasize that too much. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had an unlimited budget, which we will not, this will be a very tough budget year. That's certainly my sense of it, and you don't have to go much beyond the headlines in the newspaper to, to come to that conclusion. I think to some extent we have to approach it as, a, uh, as an economic matter, and that's very unpalatable. Well, if we, if we only look at it from Dee's perspective of how the numbers jive, then in fact that's all we're looking at. And I'm concerned that, that and I understand your proposal to put two, two proposals on the table, um, that I don't have any answers. And I mean, I, we haven't been part of this all year long, but I'm just real uncomfortable with saying, well, we're going to go with portables because it costs less, or we're going to cut up some rooms because it costs less. And um, yeah, it's, it's not the best, it's the, it's the lesser of the evils. But I'm, and I realize I'm rambling. I just, I don't have any answers. I'm, well, I'm sorry I guess we're another way to, from an economic to, standpoint only. I guess another way to uh, try to say what I said before is that I'd rather see a $50,000 proposal on the table and a $250,000 proposal on the table. And if I liked the $250,000 uh, proposal better and thought it was Best that much kids. better for the kids, I'd like to fight for that. Well, we can certainly uh, dig up a $250,000 proposal for you very easily. Uh, however, I, you know, I think uh, we looked a at this. number for illustrative purposes. <laughs> <laughs> and we looked at this uh, with, with a certain amount of responsibility. The superintendent uh, probably, along with D, knows what the budget request is at this present time. Now, for example, I'd hate to change uh, some seven additional teachers that we're going to need for our French program and four classes that we've never had before, you know, for bricks and mortar. Now, if we can afford both, fine. And we'd be more than happy to come in with a proposal for you. But uh, I can only tell you uh, that you're going to be uh, extremely surprised with the request of the superintendent's budget. Surprised happy? Surprised? Not happy surprised. Yeah, 
Uh, there are a number of things that we need and our programs are building and as you know we have some goals that uh, we've been uh, trying to strive for e.g. our foreign languages expanding uh, we have additional classroom children which means more teachers if you have more teachers you should give them uh, the same amount of phys ed music art and a host of other things that all cost a great deal of money we'll be able to discuss that in the next month uh, I don't have to tell you what's happened to salaries those have all been determined fixed costs is going up uh, people are talking about Blue Cross Blue Shield 26 percent those are all fixed costs so uh, I think we can look forward to a very large uh, request on the part of the superintendent and uh, if I hear the board uh, we will come back to you with two proposals uh, one that may appear more palatable and probably more expensive but uh, we'll be more than happy to do that and we'll present it very early in the budget uh, discussions I, I'd like to now have some input from the public before we we move on with that is there anyone that, that would like to speak about this issue Ms. Brimmer Good evening. I have uh, two sons in the middle school, one in the fifth grade and one in the eighth. So some of the things that you were proposing really will probably not have a lot of immediate effect on my children next year. But um, one of the things that Dr. Pelletier had on one of the pieces of paper here about dividing up um, the top of the old high school, which for those of you who don't know what that is, is the um, top of the intermediate building this year. Um, my son happens to be in one of those classrooms, so I've spent a lot of time going in and out of there this year, and the thought of having five fourth or fifth grade classrooms up there, um, I find to be rather unsafe, just thinking about how narrow the hallways are. Um, so that would certainly be a concern if I had a child up there in terms of a hundred children coming up and down stairways. Um, several of you have talked about the portables, and I guess I have a question. The current portable that we have now in the middle school, which is the library and the computer room, um, I've been told is a temporary building. And I'm just wondering what temporary means. How long is that building supposed to be there? I mean, do we have a sort of a life expectancy on that building? Does anybody? We have permission to... Uh use that for a period of five years at which time we have to go back to the zoning and planning board well it would seem to me um, with my very limited knowledge of the school and space that we definitely need that space now and that's we're saying that's a portable space and even if and I can't remember exactly your year here 1994-95 we may be back to our our enrollment now it still looks like we need something permanent done um, and I know having spent some time over in the school this year with the book fair that there was lots of discussion from the teachers and the students about what a lovely uh, really portable unit that is but how poorly placed the library is now and how a lot of the students are really not using that library as they did when it was up right across from the office because of really where it's located so perhaps that could be something. I mean, if we're going to do a lot of rearranging and we know that we're going to, that we do need some more space, maybe now's the time to add on a library properly. And again, I, I know nothing about, um, you know, how much that would cost, but maybe this would be the time to look at that. Certainly the library could certainly accommodate um, two or three classrooms, in my mind anyway, uh, much more adequately than the top of the fourth and fifth grade um, space. Um, my, my eighth grade son is currently in the industrial arts program and having last week listened to um, Dr. Garvin who came and spoke on middle school and how important hands-on things are, I would feel very sad if my, sick, my current fifth grade did not have an opportunity. Um, he is so proud of his cheese board that he made um, I mean, that is really in a place of honor, and I, I would feel very badly if um, that was not available for all kids, because I think um, 
the kids really need to have that, and it would be really sad to see that IA room really dismantled. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bremer. Mr. Perkins. I'm Randy Perkins, the new IA teacher here this year. Um, the way Chris approached me about this, um, I took it, the answers I gave him were ones that the things I can do, but I took it under as a threat that it was either that or not exist, um, which has happened in a lot of schools. So this is why I said I can do these things and these things need to be done. But to do them right, first of all, I can give you countless articles on this. I was reading one again this morning on you need a general shop. You need metals working equipment. You need wood working equipment. You need plastic working equipment because you're going to do problem solving things. Kids need every possible thing there is to work on. And if we go down to the space that we'll have, we won't be able to have that stuff. So that's just under that concern. When you figure the price for money, it's a $50,000 for new walls. I'm asking for a $30,000 budget if I get a small room because I need computers, I need robotic stuff. It's going to cost a lot of money. So that should go under the cost of that additional walls because otherwise I'm not asking for that type of money. I'm asking for like one computer otherwise. With this new one, I'm asking for six because I won't have the other stuff to work with. So that should all be figured as well into that cost of the $50,000. Um, and then soundproofing. I know a couple schools that it doesn't working, and I can tell you even in my room. The band room is beside mine. I have my drafting room and finishing room. So there's a wall, a 20-foot space, another wall, and then my room. And I still disturb Tony, and Tony still disturbs me. So that's a 20-foot space with two walls in it, and it still does not stop sound either way. But it doesn't bother me because of the type of class I have and it really doesn't bother him. But if it was a classroom where you're going to have reading and stuff going on, it's going to be a big consideration. I don't believe they can make soundproofing that well without moving us out totally one way or the other. So that's some of the concerns that I have. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Ms. Reed. Mrs. Reed. Thank you. Um, my question uh, is in the alternatives, if moving the band room entirely uh, was a consideration, um, the diagram seems to suggest that the current space used by BN uh, would give us two classrooms if we include the two large storage areas um, that are currently used for BN, and if that could be uh, addressed either now or uh, in the uh, follow up. Was that a consideration? On uh, several occasions, we've given some thought to uh, the alternative of moving the IA, homemaking, and uh, band to the bus garage. And we did some preliminary work along those lines to find it extremely expensive. And uh, again, sort of out of the way. But that's the only. That's the only uh, alternative location that we've looked for those areas. Um, I think, Dr. Pelletier, what I meant, though, is if we remove the band room as it sits right now into perhaps a portable or the high school space, if that space would be available, um, is, do we know how many kids are serviced by band in what periods of the day? I, 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 d I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think it's, um, if we're looking at two classrooms uh, with a common wall to the band, I think that there will be 60, excuse me, uh, 22, 44 students serviced for five and a half hours a day. I, I guess they won't always be in the classroom, but how many hours or minutes, periods, will the band be performing, practicing, uh, while these other 44 students are trying to hold class. I mean, do, I don't know if th that's important to me because um, I have uh, a current fifth grader who's in the um, um, top floor and has a wonderful classroom right now. He will be in the sixth grade um, next year. It won't affect him. Um, but, I, but I was wondering if maybe that became a sixth grade classroom. It, it 
I would want to know as a parent the answer to that. Well, Mr. Botha is busy every period with, with you know, his breaks. I would assume that either he's working with small groups most of the day or working with the, a total band uh, part of the day. So I would... I did talk to him. Did you I talk did to talk him? to him today, and he pretty much every period either has the 7th and 8th grade band meets three times a week. I believe the 5th grade and 6th grade band also meet a couple times a week. Plus, there are, are in, there are smaller instrumental groups in between that, so it's almost every period. Okay, so I think and there the are a large number of kids serviced by band. Two hundred. I don't. Know I think it's even it. maybe even more than that. So there will be music, all, constantly during the day in the room next to where two classrooms are proposed to be. When Mr. Perkins has stated. Um, that in his current industrial arts program, he can hear the band, which is quite far away from um, his classroom. So I, I was just wondering. I wanted to clarify that point. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. My name's Diane Joyce. I have four boys, sixth grade, two third grades, and a second grade. My biggest concern is moving an eighth, an eighth grader to the high school. I work for the school department. And to watch the transition between a seventh grader and an eighth grader is, is a seventh grader is not ready to go into the high school. An eighth grader needs that year of individual time to be a group, to mature, and, and to move on into the ninth grade. The fourth and the fifth grade, I've got two going into fourth grade next year. I can't imagine. The biggest thing I've hear, I hear out of a sixth grade class this year is we want to get them together as a team, to work together, to get along, to feel good about a whole group. By breaking up a fourth and fifth grader, they're never going to have that opportunity. I mean, half here, half there. Where, is it, where are we going to get it from? My son is in sixth grade, and that's the biggest thing I hear this year is we went on a fishing trip because we want to get together and be all one. We're going to Chewanke to, be, to learn to live together and, and to deal with the world. And it just, where's it going to come from when we break them all up? I mean, are we getting to the point where with such a population at the middle school, is the high school dropping down? Well, if it is, let's move them over to the middle school and we'll take over the high school. I mean, <laughs> it, there's, there's, there's so many things that, you know, and I wish there were more parents here to voice their opinion, but there's places in the school that there is extra room. I mean, if you, if you search for them, I mean, we have a cafeteria. Why can't certain parts of the day, it can't be used because we're feeding, but other parts of the day from when school starts at eight until Whenever lunch period starts, why can't it be used as a band room? And then after lunch, you have the rest of the day to use. I mean, if we utilize some space, I think the most important thing is to keep the kids together and not to send an eighth grader to a high school because it scares the heck out of me. There's too much down there for an eighth grader. It's an open world, and I don't think they're ready for it. And I just think if we search, I mean, portable classrooms, I, I didn't understand them until we're in them now. To me, it, suited the, it suits the purpose. The kids are getting what we have. We have a library. We have what we need there. It's going to cost us, but I think that we're taking the overall road of $50,000 compared to what do these kids need? They need to get on the bus and go to school and say, see you later. Even though you're in fifth grade, I'm not going to see you till I get back on the bus at the end of the day. It's not, it's not a community thing. We're not, we're not talking about a community anymore. We're talking about segregating. Even though we're all the same, we're not together. And that's a big concern for me. I moved here because it's a small community. And so many things have happened in the last few weeks. I've, I've actually been frustrated with the school department because every time my child comes home from school, what does he want? He wants money to go back to school. We're selling this, we're selling that, because we need this kind of speaker and that kind of speaker. Well, I've got four sons. And I, I finally voiced my opinion last week in the fundraiser that came home, $5 for a ticket. You know, but then to turn around and say, my son needs to call home because he forgot his homework. You can't call home. You don't have 20 cents. Call, collect, and it's eighty. I didn't buy the fundraiser. There was your ticket. And, I, and it's, the whole base is we're losing touch. 
and I think that's a scary thing. If I wanted to lose touch, I'd go into a bigger school system. I moved here because it was a small town and it was a good school system, but we're breaking them all up. And it's, I mean, I'm ready to say, put them in a private school because at least they're all there. And I think the caring of these children is getting lost in the dollar sign. And that concerns me. Thank you, Ms. Joyce. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Parker. My name is Gail Parker, and I'd like to speak not, if possible, if you can do that, not as a music teacher, although as a music teacher I certainly would be affected by these changes, but as someone who has been in this community for 20 years, I'm the mother of five, one of whom has gone through the school system, starting with kindergarten, which was in a separated building down at the Cape Church, and ending with a third grader now. I have several concerns, some of which have been addressed wonderfully, some of which I don't feel have. One is um, that the issue of soundproofing is a really critical one. Three years ago, or four, I'm not sure which, I moved to the present classroom that I'm in now. The soundproofing which was assured me three or four years ago that would take place between the other half of the home ec room and my room first consisted of the folding plastic door which was there to begin with. A year later after repeated complaints they soundproofed it by putting a wall of sheetrock on one side. That is the total extent of the soundproofing. I can hear every word Jane says in the home ec room. Her classes sometimes can answer the musical questions that my class I'm posing. They will give the answers to my students at the end of the year when we play quiz games. So I know that they can hear fairly clearly through there. Fortunately, through this, Jane and I have become uh, friends in an armed camp or enemy, I don't know. If we either had to become friends and learn to laugh about it and find ways to cope with it or we would have killed each other. I'm really concerned as a parent about the soundproofing issue and in the, the dollar breakdowns, I don't see anything for soundproofing either between the phys ed area in the gym and the stage or between, as we've already said, the band room. But the stage and phys ed area is another issue. I cannot imagine students attempting to produce music which is a risk for middle school adolescents to do, or fourth and fifth grade students. I can't imagine them doing that in competition with the volleyball game, or basketball game, or any of the other wonderful phys ed activities. I'd like to think that two quarters of the year, the phys ed department could use the outside. I'd like to think that the weather here in Maine was that wonderful two quarters of the year. I don't think it's quite that wonderful, frankly. As far as impacting on kids, the classroom which has been discussed as the chorus room is used for chorus one period a week. The rest of the entire week it is used for general music, which does impact on a very large number of students. It impacts on every fourth and fifth grader. Presently, it impacts on every sixth and every seventh grader and once a week on the eighth graders who elect music. That's quite a different picture. Now, I grant you, according to the proposals for next year, it will not impact as many. But that, in a way, is an impact, because the reason it won't impact on as many is because the program will be reduced. And that's an impact in itself. Very little has been said about the stage. I've already mentioned soundproofing. I'd like to point out the fact that also missing from that cost estimate of $50,000 is any mention of windows, is any mention of the fact that while the square foot measurements may be wonderful, when you look at the actual space, it sounds fabulous, but the apron of the stage does not have a ceiling over it, which removes several feet right there, 
because I assumed from the description that they would be building a wall in line with the stage proscenium. That will lose some square footage. If it is to be used as a choral room, which is what we have been told, and the choral risers will be moved from the band room to that general music and choral room, there goes another six foot stretch along the wall. That leaves you with a classroom which may have a wonderful square footage, but in point of classroom use by every fourth grader, every fifth grader, and however many sixth or seventh graders are scheduled into that room, would be a classroom somewhere between 12 and 14 feet wide and wonderfully long. That's not an ideal classroom space, and that does impact on a large number of students. Nowhere in that, those figures are the added costs of doing anything other than four walls in that room. And I certainly hope that there would be more than four walls in that room if it was to be changed to a classroom. I have been assured that there would be more than four walls. And without any lack of trust in the assurances, I was assured soundproofing. And Mrs. Ellis was assured soundproofing. And the fact of the matter is, in addition to being a parent and a teacher here, I am also a taxpayer, and I know that Frequently, the people who are assuring you in all good faith and with all the best wishes and best intentions do not have the power to make those intentions come true. They cannot promise those things because those things only happen when the tax money is there and when the budget process follows through. I just felt that those, some of those issues, the stage, the fact that at one time the kindergarten being separate was a plus it was made into a very wonderful plus for many, many students. Staffing changes impacting in ways that haven't even been discussed here. The soundproofing and the issue of classrooms really needs to be addressed in much more detail than what you have so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Parker. <coughs> Peter? Um, I'd just like to address moving the eighth graders to the high school with um, some of the points that you've, you've put on your sheets. I don't think that, that some of these pluses are really pluses, and you need to also take a look at the tremendous effects that the negatives on the sheet will really have. Uh, first of all, I don't really know what energize the school population means, but, but I, I can see it disrupting a balance. I, I can see it putting... 13-year-old children with 18-year-old adults, and it, it doesn't make for a good environment for the 13-year-olds who are obviously intimidated, and the 18-year-olds who, um, who, who need the, the extra space maybe, who, who, but also um, don't, don't really know, you know what's happening to them now, where, where they're going to go. Um, so it's really just a disruption. Um, also, better science facilities and labs. This, for eighth graders, I assume, this is what talking about, but we, we do have very good science facilities, one of the best in the state probably, but it doesn't make sense to me to add 25% more, more um, population competition onto that while there's already um, trouble getting time for labs and individual lab work and space to do the kinds of things that, that our program really encourages. And, and to put the eighth graders in there, to, to cite this as an advantage, when they have this, when they have these facilities, their ninth through twelfth grades, is um, is really being a little short-sighted, I think, because these it really causes more problems moving the eighth graders up there than than um, helps them. Um, when it says to integrate home economics and industrial technology, um, I don't. I assume that the eighth graders are going to be using some of the facilities in the high school. Um, this <laughs> these areas, industrial technology. Um, are one of the hardest for, for high school students to get scheduled already. And I can just see adding more competition for those rooms and for teachers to teach those classes would just run into, would mean more scheduling problems for high school students. Um, also the negatives. Um, it could impact flexibility in scheduling. Specifically, I mean, for the past two years the high school has been working, been working directly to reduce that to, to reduce the fact that, that we have a lot of problems with our schedules. We've just instituted an eight-period day this last year. We've, um, we're trying to make it so that we have less and less lab conflicts. And, and aside from the fact that 13-year-olds, that it, it, it's not the best environment for a 13-year-old to be thrown in with 18-year-olds and, 
and high school seniors, um, it does cause a lot of problems with the logistics of it that really need to be taken um, into consideration, problems such as lunches. I mean, we already have enough problem trying to, to get a good lunch in now without 70 added, added kids in each lunch. So um, I would strongly discourage on behalf of the high school moving the eighth graders up there. I realize there's space to be utilized, but I think we can do it in a lot better way. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Ms. Morrison. I just have a follow-up uh, to what Gail had said. I would hate to see the stage space utilized by her. I, that would mean I would have to give up my hope for drama and um, some type of, of performance made available in the junior high and it be presented in a suitable space. And I think that's sorely lacking. And if the stage space is, is given up, then you know there's no opportunity for that. Um, the other focus I have is as uh, a mother of a seventh grader who um, I think of and I'm still stewing about the fact that, that she lost out in a language when it was introduced last year and she was a sixth grader and she fell heir to a study period as opposed to language. So the possibility of her moving into the high school as an eighth grader, I, I have a really hard time with that. Um, I also heard Dr. Garvin last week and I mean I think it was a tribute that he was here and I recognize great momentum in the middle school and the junior high and I would hate to see that momentum lost with um, some of the changes that have been proposed. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who has not spoken that would like to speak? All right, then I think... Loretta? Yes, may I make one, yes please. One observation. Um, we're going to, in this proposal, we would reduce the industrial arts space which right now accommodates probably an average of 15 students a class. We're also going to see a growth in the next three years of kids that will be utilizing those programs in a smaller space. I'm concerned about safety, one thing, because you're gonna have increased class sizes and you're gonna be working with um, tools and that type of thing. I think we also gotta be thinking about the impact of these programs and reducing space in some of these areas. Thank you. Jan? These kinds of issues are, are so important and critical and as a school board member I like to get as much parental input as, as possible. I, I would have a suggestion that when agendas go home for school board meetings that they be in a little bit more detail than what they are now so that people clearly understand the subject that's going to be discussed at the meeting. I don't think that's always clear. It, it is to us because we're involved, but I don't think it's always clear to the public. All right. I think that's, that's well taken. Thank you. I agree. All right, so this dilemma will continue throughout the month as we go through the budget process. Um, a decision will have to be made, and uh, we realize that it's expedient but uh, I think we're not prepared this evening to make that decision and we will need at least another month to to go over some of the alternatives are you John? are you satisfied with the response about the kindergarten not moving to the high school I'm or not that should should that still be on the table as a possibility I, I personally am not satisfied with any of the responses at this point I consider all five of those possibilities some probably more feasible than others. Well, I guess, I guess the reason I ask is that before Daryl and Dee go off and start to put together the numbers, are they looking at only those two of the five proposals that we've seen tonight, or are they still? Would Mrs. Powers like to address that? Because I know she feels very strongly about this, and I, I really would appreciate her insight into this. It's, it... I kind of joked with the staff a little when I was getting ready to come before you this evening. Um, a couple of the kindergarten teachers said they'd be happy to pull the folder out. They pull out every year and dust off about all our reasons we don't want to lose the kindergarten. I mean, it comes up annually, sort of like the old fourth grade moving back and forth across the mall. And, and we paid for that. We paid a price for that. Um, I tried to make some notes about a variety of concerns. And, and, I, and I guess I'd, I'd um, 
first of all, I'd like to say I really respected the process we went through in trying to bring this proposal to you, certainly. We would look with great interest in, in the addition of some portable space and, and not having the need to slice up anything. Um, we were trying to be um, respectful of this budget process, however, and we're trying to bring you a proposal we thought was actually feasible and not pie in the sky. So I'm delighted, frankly, with your interest in us coming back and showing you that alternative, because that's certainly where we would head to start with. Um, but we did as a team try not to get into competing for whose program had the most worth, whose program better deserved to not be sliced up. And we did a, a superb job, I think, of really being careful um, with our own turf. Our biggest priority, as Daryl tried to um, say earlier, was to keep program integrity as, as the absolute um, most important thing for all of us. There are concerns, great concerns I'd have about losing the kindergarten to the high school and it kind of goes even back to my years up there in 81, 82 when the kindergarten was there. And, and I know folks have some fond recollections of their kids being in the church basements or wherever kindergartens were a long time ago. I, I have grave misgivings about that piece of our program being sliced off and, and I don't see it as a long-term a benefit for us. I see it as very short term. I'm also looking at a pre-enrollment, a strong pre-enrollment this year of 120 children at this point. Um, kindergarten has become more and more of an integral part of our program and more and more of a focus of our, of our desire to bring children as five-year-olds into public education and to have them uh, feel okay about being in a big school. And, and our whole notion of restructuring our kindergarten program is really dependent on solid relationships with the rest of the primary grades. The isolation of the kindergarten at the high school um, uh, would, would, I believe, be detrimental to the integrity of that program. I also think that moving the kindergarten to the high school and then forcing us to put either fourth or fifth grades at that end of the building will further destroy the integrity of those school communities. I, I heard your point clearly about distance factors, Loretta, and wouldn't it be closer to walk across the mall than down the hall? Hard as it is to believe, the critical factor is the going outdoors business. Um, Nancy and I have spent some time uh, outlining for the fourth and fifth grade teachers what we might be looking at in terms of having a couple of classrooms sort of away from the pack temporarily, hopefully, just maybe a couple of years while that bulge goes through. And, and the teacher said, well, what, what would your decision be? And we said, that, that won't be just us. That would be a problem solve for us. That would be finding a couple of teachers who'd be really interested and willing and working together, you know, 100 yards away versus right in the middle of the pack. And we have some teachers who have some kind of creative ideas about that. My bigger concern now is I, is I was truly relying on the notion of that soundproofing buying us um, the ability to hold classrooms and not have band and shop sounds <laughs> going through the classroom, that would be a grave concern, but I had thought that technology available would allow for those rooms to be protected, and that's the only reason that I would feel okay for that. Um, so kindergarten going to the high school buys us four rooms. We then lose the kindergarten. We lose the integrity of the fourth or the fifth grade, and, it, and the whole thing just seemed to um, put us back three steps instead of forward five, which is the direction we're heading. And I could go into enormous detail and be happy to do a paper on it if you'd like about how much the kindergarten does integrate in terms of lunchroom services and special services. And yes, they go to music and they meet the first grade team. And I, the isolation I, I is I would concerned. appreciate you doing that. I okay. Think, I think that would be helpful. As we take this all into consideration. I, right. Um, would you like in addition to, for that to, to uh, for us to include what might be placed in those four rooms and then, and then the, 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 the program problems pursuant to that as well? Okay. So. I, I just have one observation. We have uh, visited the subject before and uh, I recall being convinced a year ago or two years ago that moving the kindergarten to the high school was not a good idea. And uh, I guess I still think it's not a good idea, just as I do not idea. think that moving the eighth graders to the high school That's is a good idea. That's not a good idea either. If, if, this, if any of the other board members share that view right now, why should she do that? Uh, which of the four are a good idea of the five? Well, I think that the two that... Uh, I'm, in, I'm, in a, I'm in a dilemma that nothing looks good to me. Well, I agree with you, uh, but I, the ones that look the worst to me 
and I don't know the you know, feelings of the other board members. Is eighth grade to is, the high is school. Is eighth grade and the kindergarten. And if we were going to vote on that tonight, I would vote against both of those and look for some other solution uh, in, the, uh, in the two other, the portable scenario and the restructuring scenario. But I'd like that just so that I can fully understand it and can defend it. I want to be able to defend her reason for not going, wanting those, them to go to the high school. There, there are a lot of people that feel like that's a very plausible mm -hmm. plan, and they approach me with that a lot. And I, I, and I went over those. They're young kids. They don't, know, they don't know where they are, really. I mean, they've got, they're not ready, uh, you know, to, to feel a part of the school. Or, I mean, it would not be, they would not be taken from something that they've already had. So there are some possibilities why that is, might work. And I, if, I, and I want you to spend hours on it, but just jot down. No, it doesn't even have to be in, you know, okay. in, in a great form, but just give us the specific reasons, and then we'll try to sort through it. I, I'd appreciate having it, because I, I, was, I could not come up with enough ideas of why it was not a good idea, other than because all the others aren't particularly good <laughs> ideas either. Mm -hmm. I have trouble trying to understand how you could have a class with the band next door. I think that's oh, I have tough. a lot of trouble with that. And how you could have a choral music class with the basketballs bouncing right oh, beside you. Oh, I'm very your skeptical. So those, I think all those are... You to bring it up, the soundproofing issue. Yeah. I think that I'm, that's uh, going to be a very expensive proposition, so I think in all, my opinion. I think all this information we can get will help us sort through it and come to the right decision. Mm -hmm. Even though I agree with you that that may not be what we're favoring at all, I still think it's information that we need mm -hmm. to process. Okay. Charlie? And I think the fact that the extended daycare in the high school is working well and you have a core group of parents who are satisfied with their children being there half of every day mm -hmm. kind of gives a little more credibility to the K moving there. So mm -hmm. if you can show more of an impact, I'd, I'd, I'd speak to program impact, Charlie. Right, true. I mean, everybody's flexible. The first grade could be there. The second grade could be there. Nobody's going to die. I just like to describe to you program issues. True. But, okay. but somebody but said But that earlier. does impact mm -hmm. how parents feel mm -hmm. versus K mm -hmm. versus 8 if we had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. but, but somebody said earlier, if I'm not mistaken, that if you move the kindergarten to the high school, that would take the space that's being used for the after school program and yes, the it would. preschool program? Yes, it would. Yes. So what would you, where would you put that? We don't know where that displacement would come out. There is space at the high school for other things, I, I believe, that we mm -hmm. could find additional space at the high school. But, the, but, but just in follow-up to that, I would like us to consider, um, too, at all times, what is it we're buying by displacing that program? You know, what is it we're buying? Four rooms to further split another grade. I, I guess that's a piece of the follow-up to that question. Then um. my response to that convinces us mm -hmm. for the report. Mm -hmm. Fine. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara, very much. I appreciate it. I think we'll, we, we have a, yes, Mr. Tinsman, is it? Yes. I, I think this will need to be our last speaker. I, I, I don't think I'll be excluding anyone. Good. Because <laughs> we're, we're just beginning our agenda and it's 930. Well, I, I have a concern, first of all, about the eighth grade going into the high school. I have uh, a fifth grader and a fourth grader, and I would certainly not like to see them be put into a high school situation as eighth graders. I think um, the age difference of ninth graders going into the high school is enough of a difference between the 18-year-olds eight, and, and the 15-year-olds being together. Um, it seems to me the natural tendency would be to put the kindergarten into the high school uh, for the reason that you mentioned earlier that they have not already been part of a school system uh, I understand the reason for wanting to integrate them into a school system and, 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 and having them feel like they're part of the, uh, the system but it seems to me that the difference between an 18 year old <coughs> and, a fi and a 5 year old is I noticed with my own kids the the bigger the gap in age, the better they get along. Um, and, and what seemed to me with the extended daycare, with the young children already there, uh, it seems to be working out well. And I think the older kids take to the younger kids a lot better. If we have the space, I think it would be a natural to have the younger kids use it. Um, and that way you have the younger or the middle age groups staying together more once they're into the 
the middle school and the intermediate schools. Um, I think also moving the eighth graders into the high school situation, you're competing more for the same facilities. And I've been to the different various boards in the town talking about my desire to use some of the spaces as a uh, community services uh, coach for, for basketball, and I know we, we can't get space now. Um, and I can't see that situation improving. If you put another grade into the high school, they're going to be competing for space. Um, that's certainly not going to free up the middle school at all. Um, but I guess I just want to voice my opinion about the eighth grade move. I'm, I'm very much against that. Uh, I would like, you know, I'm certainly not as qualified as Ms. Powers either to, to come up with the reasons that a kindergarten should move to the high school, but as a parent, I would not have that problem. As a matter of fact, when my oldest boy was in kindergarten, he spent quite a bit of time in the high school. And uh, it seemed to work very, very well for him. And I, I don't see that there's any conflict in the age groups of the high school students with the younger ages. They almost feel more of a desire to bring them along than they would if they were older children competing for the same services that they're trying to receive from the school. Um, so my opinion is that the kindergarten should be looked at in terms of taking them to the high school if that is going to be something that will save taxpayers money. Thank you, Mr. Dinsley. All right, well, this, this will continue. We'll work on this during the month. Uh, particularly, I think we need to look at the possibility of financing for portables. And then we'll continue to look at the, uh, the other proposals. Um, the budget process starts March. 8th of March. So that's before the next school board meeting. So, so I, for, for you who are interested, I would, I would suggest that you try to be here for these budget meetings if possible, because this will, I'm sure, surface again during the budget process. So uh, we'll have these posted. And that is the middle school budget. Too. And it starts with the middle school budget on the 8th of March. So I'm sure this will be uh, talked about publicly at that time. So we will table this until next month and move on to the second part of the superintendent's report, which was a report on his Dartmouth trip. Just a very uh, fast uh, report on the Dartmouth trip. Uh, first, I met with our new regional uh, admissions director. It was an opportunity to meet with her and uh, presented our case that uh, we were concerned that uh, we were not uh, getting our students into uh, Dartmouth the extent that we would appreciate and that uh, some of our students, students would be being discouraged. And uh, she indicated that she would convey that to the uh, committee. Uh, just for your own benefit, uh, they anticipate 10,000 applications. They'll take 1,000. 50 are international and 50 are transfer students. And uh, the competition is vicious. That's about the only word I can use. How do you get a transfer student into the freshman class? Uh, I don't think when they say a thousand, they mean a thousand freshmen, a thousand new people. I see. And I suspect that most of their transfers are from uh, junior, two-year junior colleges. But I, you're right, I always generally assume that they're all freshmen and they're not at 50 are going to be transferred. They could be seniors. So all in all, it was a good trip and I'm hopeful that it's beneficial and we'll only know uh, in a month or two. You did mention the, t the price tag for Dartmouth <laughs> now. Down here. They, uh, they <laughs> didn't want to give it to me, but it would be in the vicinity of something like 22,000. And that's a year, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how people are going to afford colleges like that. All right. I, you also have a report on the co-curricular committee that yes, met? Yes, uh, the co-curricular committee met uh, in line with uh, our negotiation uh, policy. And uh, one decision was made that uh, inasmuch as we have changed the organization and a number of changes have come about in the last two years, we are now starting, uh, as of February 1, uh, an hourly check. You know, these are all based on hours uh, devoted to the task. 
and we'll do a survey between February 1 and February 1 of next year so that if we find any uh, significant changes, uh, they'll be part of negotiations. So that's all, uh, that's the only, that's the only decision the committee made. And it's a recommendation and they've started. All right, thank you. And the Athletic Fee Committee. Uh, the Athletic Fee Committee, uh, the board member is here to report on that. Peter uh, was there. It's a very short report. Uh, everything remains the same in terms of the athletic uh, program, except that we've added one extra basketball coach for a seventh and eighth uh, <coughs> boys team. And that is the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a report on Project Dare. Dr. Pelletier? Yes, the curriculum director is going to report on that. Uh, Michael Ephraim is with us tonight. I'm right. sorry, I didn't mean it quite that way. He's always <laughs> with us. <laughs> always with us. You made that. Yeah. <laughs> highly highly sorry, unusual. <laughs> Proud to have you here too, Michael. And I needed to stand up and stretch. Um, I need your approval to proceed with our uh, planning for Project Dare. And the reason I need your approval is because Project Air is a joint program that the school uh, schools want to take with take on with the police department. The police are at the point now of developing their budget, and they need to make a financial commitment to the training of an officer and to uh, and for their staffing for next year. <coughs> so before. Um, they go ahead and actually make a financial commitment. I, f I feel like I need to present this to you and make sure that this is okay with the school board. Okay? Um, this all started with a meeting uh, in Dr. Pelletier's office, uh, Chief uh, Pickering, Captain Tolan, and uh, Don Tubbs uh, were at the meeting. Uh, Don is the, person, is the police officer who uh, has been designated to, to do the training and to be our person who will be teaching uh, in the classroom. The program uh, was developed by uh, health educators in California. The program started in Southern California. It's a, my understanding of it, and I've seen outlines of it, and I've heard and I've spoken to a number of uh, people um, from, from some other states that have been doing project there for a while is that it's very strong health education. Uh, it's designed for uh, fifth or sixth graders and in a lengthy conversation with uh, uh, the folks from Virginia who uh, have implemented project there in every school system in Virginia, their recommendation when I described our situation was, to, was for us to implement it at the fifth grade level. Structurally, that's a very uh, good recommendation for us because we didn't have a comprehensive health program of this nature at the fifth grade. We do have, uh, we do have much more of a comprehensive health program at the sixth grade with Quest. So if we had tried the sixth grade, it would have involved an awful lot of coordinating with programs that were in place. At the fifth grade, it really is filling a need and doesn't have that kind of um, uh, uh, implementation problem. This, uh, you, you have the project here booklets in front of you, okay. The, the outline of the program has been uh, re shared by the Pond, Hope, Pond Cove Health Committee, by the uh, Middle School Health Committee, um, by the administrators, and by, um, uh, uh, and by the fifth grade team, okay? All, all of those steps are important because this will eventually be a piece <coughs> of what we will eventually build as a comprehensive K through 12 health program. So this piece that we're putting into the fifth grade will eventually be sequenced with a program that gets developed K-5. It will be sequenced with uh, an ongoing developing program uh, six through eight. Okay, so this isn't gonna be sitting in isolation of what we're doing all around it. 
the fifth grade teachers were enthusiastic. They really, uh, they had good memories of uh, a previous time when we had joint programming with the police. Um, they were fairly knowledgeable of uh, how Project DARE is going in South Portland, where, where it's seen as being very positive. So the fifth grade teachers were very receptive. The plan would be, <coughs> if we get the go ahead, that uh, we would bring Don Tubbs and have him join the fifth grade team and they would work out all the implementation issues jointly on exactly the timing and, and the space issues and uh, how often we would, the, the very, the structure and the way we would offer it, they would do jointly as a team. Okay, and there's a number of options, but I would really trust the fifth grade team to put that together with, with uh, Don. The program that we do have in place is a program that Amy Melick uh, uh, presents uh, to fifth grade classrooms and in this implementation we would coordinate what Amy is doing with Project DARE. The costs for all of this um, fall much, much heavier on the police department than they do, for, than they do on us. Um, the police would uh, encumber the costs for training uh, the officer and for the officer's time that they would be with us next year. I, I should mention the model, the model is a co-teaching model. Uh, if you look, if you look um, toward the back of the booklet, you see that there's about 18 lessons, 17 lessons to be taught roughly uh, one period each. Um, so roughly once a week for a semester is one possible way that we'll implement it. Uh, when Don is in the classroom, Don will be the lead teacher. The classroom teacher will be there and will co-teach with Don. So, so uh, our regular fifth grade teacher will be, in help, will be there and help implement and then also help follow through on whatever makes sense to follow through from the lessons. Um, okay, so I said the cost for the officer's time next year when they're with us is borne by the police department. What we will cover uh, on our side of the budget is we will cover printing costs and supply costs for the program. Um, it looks as if the police officers association are going to contribute $900 to the program to buy the films and AV. Uh, software associated with the course. I'm not sure that that's definite yet, but it looks like they're going to make that contribution. So we're looking at a total supply cost uh, for, for our uh, part of the program of somewhere between a thousand and two thousand dollars, and I've and I have that earmarked in my budget. I had six questions and you answered them all. So, <laughs> great. Just have given uh, Jan. I don't have a problem with this specific program, but I really am concerned about adding another layer of um, this type of program for children in the schools. Um, when you talked about coordinating this program with what Amy Mellick is doing, I was under the impression after speaking with her that that this is basically what she's doing. So are you saying that she would still be going into the classroom and doing, you know, she goes in, I don't know, for a period so many weeks, would she still be doing that? Plus the kids would be getting this too so that that much more time would be eliminated from their already crowded schedule? I'm surprised to hear you say that Amy, Amy says that this is what she's already doing. I'm talking about things like talking about decision-making skills and resisting peer pressure and those kinds of... I'm how, not how talking often, about specific... How often is Amy in fifth college. grade classrooms? Would you say, Nance? No, it's twice, yeah, it's less than that. 
The problem of coordinating this with what Amy does is not, is not a big problem. I think that we can work that out. Amy is providing uh, some outreach preventative counseling services to those classrooms and in no way I would, would I call that uh, a comprehensive health program. We're just not to that point. But I guess I wonder how much the, counseling do the kids need on, on all of this? I, I, I see it as, you know, they go through the elementary school and they have somebody coming into their classroom there to talk with them. There's a, there's a pull-out program um, at that point. The, the fourth and fifth graders have Amy coming in to, to, to talk with them. Then we're, we're adding this on to it. And, and from what I understand, uh, teachers have a difficult time already finding time to teach science and social studies. Well, I just, I, I have to wonder how many parents would support this or would rather see perhaps a volunteer program where if you want your child to take part in something like this, you volunteer it to happen. But I question the need for both. You know, maybe, maybe D.A.R.E. would be good in place of something that's already happening. I don't know. I, I get the feeling that you don't think Amy's doing as much as you do. I think that, that may be the, the differentiation here. Um, is this, in fact, duplication of her current efforts, or is it in addition to her efforts? Um, I think one of the most important things we can do for our kids is give them, we can't give them too much information when it comes to this. And if we don't have a comprehensive program in the fifth grade, if Amy isn't providing the comprehensive program and this will help make it a comprehensive program, I support that. But I don't think, and I agree with Jan, that it should be a duplication of efforts. Amy should have her area to deal with, and if we decide to take on Project DARE, that should be another area. No, I, I agree with that, John. I think you said it exactly correctly. Um, Jan, I'm, I'm not sure quite how to answer you. Um, One of the focuses of this program, and if you look at the appendix where, where the lessons are outlined, there's a focus around um, building self-esteem, uh, working on decision-making, uh, preparatory stuff so that kids have the kind of stamina that it takes to uh, resist use of drugs and substances. But do all children, and do all children need this? Are, are there studies that show that if you provide it for every single child that, that that's what it takes or are there certain at-risk children or? I, I think, uh, I think if you look at what, at you, if you look at the concerns of what goes on at the high school, it's, it's hard to argue that, that the job is being done here and, and this effort isn't needed. Uh, there, there's a limited number of I'd say there's a limited number of kids who at, by the high school level have gotten themselves to the point with, 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 where they have addiction problems but you have significant numbers of kids who are uh, who are abusing alcohol and other substances to the point that the high school presently isn't running dances because of what goes on before a dance. And you're talking about uh, huge proportions of, of, the student, of the student body who goes to those dances, which are primarily ninth and 10th graders. And you're talking about, dare I make a guess here, uh, certainly more than 50%. Well, potentially and, every and child in America is at risk. That's right. with, Absolutely. Uh, that's right. you, and you Absolutely. couldn't distinguish at this age. I mean, so maybe you could, you could to say the Amish uh, you know, hardly ever have this problem, but I can't think of any other group offhand. Not even sure about that one. I believe you'll find that, that the studies have shown in the, in the um, authorities field, the earlier you educate, the earlier 
that you can stop potential problems. Uh, and, I, and, the, and, the, and the drug and alcohol problem is now really in the, in the middle school age. That's where the predominant problem. So therefore, you've got to start educating even earlier. I don't have a problem at all with educating the children. I just want to know how far is it going to go? How many programs are we going to introduce? How many are going to overlap? How much time is going to end up being taken um, away from, from the rest of the academic program? From what I understand, this program, the police officer would be in the school one day a week, correct? 17, there's 17 lessons. Yeah, but he would be in the school one day a week. I'm not sure how we'll work out the implementation. Okay. And each um, class is about 15 to 20 minutes long? No. The program, well that's what you No, 45 okay. to 60 okay. minutes. Okay. Yeah, it's, a re it's a regular 40, 45 minute class. Well, I think to, to address Jan's question again, I think that if we're looking at a coordinated curriculum program for math, sciences, social studies, and, every, and language, I think we need the same thing for health. And if this fits in, if this is another piece of that puzzle that you're trying to develop, let's look yes. at it. Yes, that, that's, and that's why I stated it that way, is that we are going to, we'll, we'll know more about this program once Don gets trained and we get to actually see the materials that he starts bringing and showing us. I'm told that this is uh, strong health programming, age appropriate for fifth graders. Uh, we have nothing in place there right now. And, uh, and we will be making use of it in a way that's, that's coordinated with an overall program that's going to, that you'll be You'll beginning to hear more and more about the program um, as we develop it uh, over the next year at the middle school. So you would utilize this as the health period? Yeah. For the period that he's in the classroom? Yes. Yes. I like the idea of it being a uniformed policeman and that the teacher being in the classroom a part of the program. Is that correct? They, they would be in that classroom working with him? Yes. Okay. Jointly. It's the piece, the piece that I really, sh uh, um, come back to, to, to a piece of your concern that I really do share, uh, is I think there's, there's very much a need for this kind of programming. It doesn't, if, stids, if, if, if our students start making uh, really bad decisions uh, around uh, substances, um, it w will not have been sufficient that we taught them writing well because we're looking at a wholer child than that. The, the concern that, that I really share in what you're saying is, is um, the press that we have on covering so many different subject areas and, uh, and at some point how do, how do we sort that out? And how do we make sure that we're not violating the, the integrity of the academic areas, which, which are very high priority? Uh, that's, an, that's a real balancing act, and that's a real concern, because we have, we're talking about now about health programming that isn't in place, so, so it feels additional. But it should have been in place all along, and we're catching up. But as we bring in more programs and more offerings, we, we really do start spreading the, our teachers and our kids out over too many subject areas, and that's something that, that we need to continue watching, and I encourage, I encourage you to, to keep watching that issue because it's a real one. I, I agree with that concern. And I concur with Jan's concern about duplication of, of services, too. I think that should be addressed. Absolutely. It and, presents and, and, a nice opportunity to, to work with another institution in town that might lead to some very favorable things. This recommendation also came out of the community team, which there is a policeman on that team, and these are representative people from the schools. You have a representative from your school board, and there are parents. So this was a recommendation from the community team to approach the school about instituting this. Any other questions? All right, then do I hear a motion that we uh, 
Institute project dare in our school system at fifth grade level? I so move. Moved. moved by Mr. Greer, seconded by Mr. Leslie. All in favor? Opposed? I want to make it clear, too, that I am not opposed to Project DARE. I just don't feel like I have enough information at this point to know what overlapping is going on. Well noted. Thank you very much. I want to make one other request. Stay on, stay on the issue of health education yes. for a little bit longer. Um, we, have, we have a... Um, you know, a solid health program in place, in place at the high school. One of the things that's missing uh, that the high school uh, health educators would like would be a community advisory board, a com uh, community health advisory committee to work with them. Um, some of the things that they'd like to do with such a uh, uh, community advisory group would be to review present curriculum, to have a sounding board from the community to, uh, uh, to talk about some of the controversial issues that get raised in present curriculum, um, to have a group to look at potential new curriculums that, that they consider and that uh, might be considered for the program, and to um, help sort through some of the decisions and some of the policies that we might want to consider with regards to health education issues. Uh, and to also help them network uh, with some resources in the community that they might make use of in, in, in their health programming. Um, if, we, if we go ahead, if that sounds okay to you, to, to go ahead and try to put together an advisory group from the community for, for the uh, health program. Uh, number one, I guess number one is, uh, how does that sound to you? We'd like to do it, but we'd want your endorsement, number one. Number two, uh, we, would want, uh, we would want somebody from the board to, um, to be on the group. Do, do we need to give an endorsement of this, or is so, this? Just, I mean, I'm just letting you know about it. You don't yeah, need to. Good. You don't need I, to say anything right I, now. I think that's but I just your, want your you to decision. let you know we're we're sort of gearing up to begin putting that together. Right. And, and, it, and when and it gets together, let us know, and we'll have a contact person on this board. Okay, terrific. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. We'll move on to the board chairman's report. I wanted to report on two workshops that were held this past month. On Thursday, January 25th, um, the school board and a large group of parents and administrators met to talk about the Gifted and Talented program. Uh, much time was spent comparing the advantages and disadvantages of a pullout program versus a program that remains in the classroom with a consultant aiding uh, the teacher. And both programs, it was learned, do have their strengths and weaknesses. The board was updated on the gifted and talented consultative model which is being used this year as a pilot program in the fourth grade. And the administrators um, had asked, I believe at the previous school board meeting, that that model be extended into fifth grade next year and, and that was approved by the board. Um, the present fifth grade will continue with its pullout program next year as well uh, the present sixth and seventh grade. The high school is organizing a gifted and talented study committee, and they held their first meeting to begin dialogue, I believe last week, and Charlie Greer from our board will serve as a representative of the school board on that committee. A second workshop was held on Thursday, February the 1st. This was a high school work in progress workshop, uh, which began with Principal Frank Miles relating his visions of what a high school should be. Uh, a lot of time was spent with teachers and department chairman, administrators, a few parents and school board members discussing issues that the high school faces. And the board looks forward to other workshops in the near future with the high school where specific department by department goals uh, and overall short and long term goals uh, can be shared at, at a more lengthy uh, time. Uh, the board. Um, 
wants to increase its understanding of the high school. And uh, we feel like the workshop is the best opportunity for that to happen uh, so that we can learn the, uh, the strengths of the curriculum and the innovative programs that are happening at the high school. We, I would like to encourage the community to attend these workshops because this is really the best way that you have and the best way that the board has of getting very detailed information about programs in the school system. And we're having uh, workshops monthly, in some cases more than once a month. And I think that uh, you would find them very informative and you would get a very clear understanding of, of these programs. And so we really encourage you to come. And we'll move on to our Main Street 90 report. And I'll let Charlie Greer, who serves on this committee with me, give this report. Charlie? Thank you. Uh, as Loretta stated, Loretta and myself are the school board representatives who have met twice with Main Street 90 representatives, Priscilla Hare and Audrey Jordan. And we have been joined by Sue Weatherby from Community Services. And we've also met once with Dr. Pelletier uh, the purpose was to facilitate and promote school participation in community awareness through either curriculum topics or community projects. As an example, the sixth grade class of teacher Janet Nesson has been recognized already by Main Street 90 for an ecological project which was promoting recycling last fall. This is the type of community interaction that they would like from the schools and we are trying to encourage that. Thank you. We'll move on to new business. We have a consideration of the superintendent's nomination for continuing contract teachers. Dr. Pelletier? Before I uh, present these, uh, are there any, is there any other information that you'd like to have me bring to any of the board members? I would like to table one nomination until I get further information from the superintendent, superintendent concerning that position, and that is the position of Gretchen Berg, one half time theater artist. Theater artist, all right, certainly. I'll have that date for you. If there are no others, I'd like to present Jill, Jill Blackwood, grade five, Claire Rutenberg, gifted and talented, Elizabeth Kelsey, French, Margaret Welch, grade seven, Madeline Darman, nurse educator, six tenths, Laura <coughs> Art, four, five, and six. I do want to say that we are extremely pleased with these people, and they have already made a real contribution. And I recommend they be given their continuing contributions. Okay. Do I hear, hear a motion that we accept these teachers onto continuing contracts in the Cape Elizabeth School System? So. So one. Second. Mr. Holt. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. I certainly welcome them aboard. They're wonderful teachers. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Can I? I'm sorry, I was late. <laughs> yep. I was in favor, I was not opposed. I like the record this morning. All right, we have a regional administrative recertification renewal plan report. Uh, this, uh, this is being presented to uh, Cape Elizabeth Board, Portland, Scarborough, South Portland. We've divided in this area into three regions for renewal of certification. This will start this year and be in effect next year with an overall committee. Uh, this has to be sanctioned by all four boards and sent to the commissioner to be accepted. This was done by a committee of uh, administrators I met with them on several occasions, and uh, Mary Bruns worked on this committee along with us, so we've been very close to this. This is modeled pretty much the way most of the regional uh, recertification plans are. I'm very pleased with it, and I hope you ratify it so we can send it to the commissioner and uh, the administrators who have to be recertified will start next year. Thank you. Are any questions from the board regarding this recertification renewal plan? Do you have any idea what the costs are, participation costs at this time? Yes, uh, we're given $100 <coughs> per administrator from the state. And that $100 will be turned over to the region uh, at this point in time. Uh, I suspect, in all honesty, that uh, unless the state starts to come through, when this recertification really gets moving, it's going to cost the local people 
a certain amount of money. See, they've turned the whole table, both teachers and administrators, back to the locals. So I don't think we're, I, I think we're fooling ourselves if we feel that we're, not, we're gonna get away with $100. It's ridiculous. Just the in-service training programs are going to cost a great deal of money. We're gonna have to pay the universities for a host of things. I suspect that in time, it's gonna cost the, the locals. I know I asked this question at the last school board meeting, but I thought maybe you might have an update about costs. Thank you. But this is mandated that there be a recertification plan. Well, it's, yes, I mean, it's, this is not it's something that we're doing local because we chose to do. All right. Any further discussion? Do I hear a motion that we accept the uh, regional administrative recertification renewal plan as presented? Mm -hmm. Mr. Second. Leslie, second by Mr. Greer. All in favor? <coughs> Okay, a report card for our main schools. Dr. Pelletier. Uh, as you know, this uh, was promoted by the governor and the commissioner, and this is the second year uh, we received it. Uh, and it uh, really is information we already know about our schools. I would call your attention, though, to uh, page six and seven, where we have been labeled what is now a star school unit for grades four, grades eight, and grades 11. And uh, I might add that in Maine, that's a distinction that we should be proud of. And I'm extremely pleased with the, uh, the change in the science score, which was already very high for the 11th graders. You'll note it's gone up almost 30 points on page seven. Could I just make a point that the reason four, eight, and 11 were singled out is because those are the years that we give the main assessment test. Is that correct? Yeah. It does not show a deficiency in any of the other grades, <laughs> yeah, correct? Yeah, the other grades. <laughs> Good. 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 I wanted people to know that there was a no. reason why oh those, those three. I had it to my backup that we had, would have some of these available for the public, yes. but we only have one left. So if you give us two weeks, we'll try to get some more. It's nice to be a star school. Uh, reappointment to the Advisory Committee of Community Services. Yes, uh, I'd like to pass this on to you. Uh, Susan Mitchell. Uh, Susan Mitchell is on the advisory board. Is filling, is filling an unexpired term of Nancy Sanger. And uh, her application is in your packet and the Community Service Advisory Committee uh, would like to have her remain as the, along with Sue Weatherby, and it has to be a board appointment, school board appointment. I would recommend that you do so this evening, and she would serve a full term. Do you hear a motion that we accept uh, Ms. Mitchell to the Advisory Committee of Community Service? Can I make a comment? Yes. The I, is, I believe she's chairman of that advisory committee at the present time. Is she not? Okay. Maybe I hear such then a by motion. all means, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we uh, appoint her to the position of community services. All right. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? Oh. All in favor. <laughs> Get me so nervous. <laughs> Throw these curves okay. across late at night. The consideration of retirement. Yes, uh, I'd like to present the uh, consideration of retirement of uh, Joan Cannell, effective at the end of the school year. All right. Do I hear a motion that we accept Ms. Cannell's retirement at the end of the school year? So moved. Ms. Solon? I second. <laughs> Mr. Career, any discussion? Uh, I would certainly like to wish her well in her retirement. In, uh, Tell her how much she is appreciated by the board in her years of service to Cape Elizabeth school system. And we wish her well. All in favor of accepting her retirement? Opposed? Motion passes. Consideration of a resignation. Yes, I would like to pass on the resignation of Lucille Emery, our high school librarian, commencing at the end of the school year. I recommend that the board accept this. Okay, do I hear a motion that we accept 
Mrs. Emery's resignation. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Oh, no, sorry. Discussion. Well, I, <laughs> well I, I, I know that she has been certainly been appreciated as a librarian and uh, wish her well in her uh, other pursuits. And I know that the high school is very sorry to be losing her. And she's been certainly appreciated. How long has she served? I think four, three years. Has she been there two years or three years? Mrs. Emery. Third year. It'll be three years. Oh, she's retiring. She's retiring. Thank you. Her, her letter, and I was going to mention that, her letter says resignation, but I gather she's retired. All right. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? All right. Motion passes. Consideration of a leave of absence. I'd like to present a leave of absence without pay for the 1990-91 academic year for Sally Martin, a high school English teacher. All right. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Okay, we wish her well. I, I think her letter said she was planning to write a book. So we, uh, we may all recognize ourselves one of these days in one of Mrs. Martin's books. <laughs> all right. At this time, I have a consideration uh, of a request by the superintendent to. There is one more. One more. Leave of absence. Excuse me. Yes, excuse me. Consideration of a leave of absence. Dr. For, uh, Susan Holmes for the academic year 1991, elementary teacher in special education. This is the second year she's asked for continuing. What does that require us at the end of the second year if she wants to come back, we have to find a place for her, or how does that work? She notifies us as of uh, February 1 next year, and uh, we have to find something comparable for her. Now, uh, she could, you know, if we got to the point where we were we were letting teachers go. She could bump someone depending on where her status was. However, uh, I have never recommended a second year leave of absence unless I've checked with the individuals and they find that it's a fabulous teacher. And uh, I found that here. I just didn't know what, what our obligation was. That's, that's, I've seen the years, obviously, but never two years. How will this impact? the teacher that's now taking her place? I'm not sure. Let me ask uh, Barbara. As soon as um, Susan presented this request to me, which I also would um, propose you honor, um, I checked with the teacher who we hired to take her place. She was willing to stay on with us. We'd like to find a permanent home for her with us. She's outstanding also. So I, I, don't, I don't see this at all as a, anything but a win-win situation for us. I was on that interviewing committee and she was very impressive, so that was why I asked the yes. question. Do I hear a motion that we uh, extend Mrs. Hobbs' leave of absence? So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay. At this time, we have a consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for purposes of discussion, discussing negotiations and personnel matters. Do I hear a motion? So move. Second. Second. All in favor? The meeting is adjourned. <coughs>